before I start uh, this video, and it'll be on the Aleph Tav eclipse of April 8th, post dating that eclipse, that being April 9th, I believe what we shall see is a certain threshold that has been passed at that point. Once this threshold has been passed, we are on the, the, the sort of incline to the Aeon of Aquarius or this Saturnian Regna, this new kingdom, this new Atlantis, new Jerusalem, Ben Salem, this type of utopian vision held by uh, the mystery religions since, you know, time immemorial. All of the mystery religions that have come off the, the Kabbalistic tree, that is. So therefore, I wish to just make clear, nothing really will happen on that day, I don't think. But what you will see is afterwards, that will be seen as some sort of inflection point, uh, psycho-spiritually speaking, and of course, geopolitically speaking, as well. So firstly, this is going to be a very long video. I'm not going to get into the Aeon of Aquarius notes on this. This entire section is about 45 pages. I've been writing for about seven or eight days. I, I've had to sort of put the Aeon of Aquarius notes to the side right now so I could get this video out. Uh, just before or just on the eclipse date. But this is going to be a, a rundown of all the, the very strange astronomical um, instances and overlaps with, with uh, events, not just now, but that have occurred uh, in the past as well. Of course, the Aeon of Aquarius notes, which, is, which are in this section, the Aleph Tav eclipse, and this is part of a a larger um, book that I'm working on called Yahweh is Satan. Uh, you know, a very polemical book, as you can imagine. That will deal with the, the concept of what this eclipse um, is heralding. It's heralding the Aeon of Aquarius. Aquarius is under the planet of Saturn, uh, traditionally, in modern uh, astrology, it's under Uranus, but traditionally it's under Saturn or Kronos, time, right? The god of time, the titan of time. So I detail that and I link it back obviously to Yahweh and uh, the, the, the sort of Abrahamic lord deity. It's very interesting and I link that to obviously AI and the other characteristics of the Aeon of Aquarius, right? That we're going to see the breaking down of categories, the undoing of the natural and cosmic order, eh, so on and so forth. And just before I start as well, I have a new book out, which I didn't do a trailer for, uh, nor could I globally distribute it. I suspect that was because the book is only... I believe just under 50 pages, if I last checked. So it's, it's very digestible. And it goes through the Radonites, the Hidden Empire. And it's um, on the origins of the merchant elite, how they came to be. It's extremely important. Of course, it's, it is very condensed. I didn't even think it was that condensed when I was writing it. But it's, it's extremely interesting. You can get that from Lulu. I'll put a, a link in the description. And furthermore as well, if you could leave a like, a comment, share this, uh, press the subscribe button, the, the, the bell notification, um, to be notified when I upload and such. Anything to help uh, the algorithm, if you will. The, to, to sacrifice a comment at the altar of the algorithm, if you would be so kind. So to begin with these notes, the Aleph Tav Eclipse. On April the 8th, 2024, the final celestial event of this of the auspicious seven-year tri-ecliptic phenomenon 
known as the Aleph Tav Eclipse will end. This will portend the beginning of the end of the USA and the emerging of the new kingdom, the Saturnia Regna, the kingdom of Saturn, the rebirth of it, under the new retrograde, the Ion of Aquarius. Now, of course, this is all archetypal and psychological, a change of our very consciousness, and that is seemingly written within the stars and etched into the patterns of nature herself. The symbiosis we share with Gaia is such that man may be led to conclude that we are but vicarious instruments for the will of the Great Mother. Perhaps we are, but man must hold to even the illusion of free will, lest he lose all sense of direction and purpose within this grandiose cosmic stage performance. However, with that rather ponderous thought behind us, we understand too that this ecliptic event marks the midpoint of the Grand Sothic Cycle, or Yeovil Cycle. It does make one question the name of the preeminent data, data is dystopian, Yuval Noah Harari. Mm. The Grand Sothic Cycle was initiated during the Gateway Year of 2001, and the catalyzing event that took place then, which 49 years, 7 squared, post-dating that year, is the general terminus point of most of the think tank and NGO plots or agendas. Is this coincidental? No, nothing within this world is. In fact, as a point of correction, prior to us delving into the constitutive information on the ecliptic event, I do believe that the exact lapse of time between the 2017 Great American Eclipse, forming the middle line of the Aleph Tav, or beginning and end, and the end of this ecliptic cycle, in April 8th, 2024, is exactly, get a load of this, six years, six months, six weeks, and six days from the initiating date of this aforesaid cycle on the 21st of August, 2017. This quadruple six is something I'll get on to uh, later on. So, all, so obviously the Aleph is the first letter of the Paleo-Hebrew alphabet. Again, it's, it's like a sideways A or a um, sort of slanted A, which is what we see with this eclipse. And the Tav, in its Paleo-Hebraic uh, script uh, variant or version, it is the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and it is in the shape of a saltire, an X, right? An X marks the spot, that type of um, thing. In addition, we will find later on that these eclipses have a great deal of interrelation with the ancient traditions and mythos of Kemet, or ancient Egypt, the Black Land. But the truth and fascinating numerical occurrences of this age-defining eclipse is also reflected within the sacred architecture and divine mathematics, etched into the very fabric of the enigmatic structure of the Great Pyramid and the pyramidal complex at Giza. Let us briefly list the interconnections between the mathematical and geometrical properties of the Great Pyramid, with the pyramidal complex being a terrestrial mirroring of Orion's belt, that which points eastward to the star of Sirius, the scorcher, immolator, the glowing one, like that of the Seraphim of Hebrew. Uh, seraphim, Seraph literally means um, the burning one, right? Or that which burns. So Seraphim, the Im is obviously the plural, so hence burning ones, right? Within Canis Major and westward to Alderbaran, Aldebaran means the follower, is a point to note, a slight bit of trivia that relates to the Hyksos of ancient Egypt, we find that if one draws a straight line from the pyramid of Menkaure to the pyramid of Khufu, and then extrapolates that straight line out in its observable direction, then one will intersect with the centre of the ancient site of Avaris, the capital of the northern Hyksos kingdom, 
On this potential of the pyramids being tied in some way or built by the Hyksos, we find it written that, quote, The earliest evidence of the 4th dynasty Hyksos comes from fragments by Isaac Corey, 1832, in which Manetho clearly states that the 3rd dynastic rulers were composed of Memphite kings and the 5th dynasty of Elephantine kings. The 4th dynasty, however, was said to be composed of eight Memphite kings of a different race. Manetho also says that Cheops was arrogant towards the gods, closed the temples, and wrote the sacred book. Wow. So again, sort of proto-Atonism, proto-Abrahamism, proto, uh, in a sense. The following interpretation from Miracle of Ages adequately describes the now famous conversation between Herodotus and Manetho. In the course of his questioning, he, Herodotus, encountered one Manetho, an Egyptian high priest, scholar and historian, with whom he conversed at length through the agency of an interpreter. Manetho informed his distinguished guest that the architect of the huge mass of stone was one Philition, or again, like, like you know, a Palestine, like a Palestinian, like um, a Philistine, if you will, or Sufis, or Sufis, or Shufis, right, of a people known as the Hyksos, that is shepherd kings. According to Manetho, the shepherd kings were a people of ignoble race, who came from some unknown land in the east. They were a nomadic band who numbered not less than 280,000 souls. Um, spoiler alert, I get into it within my book Blood on the Sand and a few other books I've yet to release, but and of course my videos as well, where I make it abundantly clear that the Hexos or um, the Isirir, the, the Amar, the Amorites, they're all interconnected. Essentially, they're, they're proto-Israelites, if you will. They're the proto-people that would later found the Kingdom of Israel and then that divided into the Northern Kingdom of Samaria, or Israel proper, and uh, the Southern Kingdom of Judah. But these are the proto-typical state of, of the later Israelite Kingdom and Israelite peoples. They brought with them their families and all mobile possessions, including vast flocks of sheep and herds of cattle, and they had the confidence to invade Egypt and subdued it without a battle. This same people, said Manetho, overthrew the then reigning dynasty, stamped out idolatry, and endeavoured to firmly establish in place thereof the worship of the one true God. Wow! Having completed the Great Pyramid, they migrated eastward into the land afterwards, eh, known as Judea, and founded their city of Shalem, or Jerusalem, which later, or Yerushalim, which later became Jerusalem, the holy city. It is noted that although Manetho is a proud Egyptian, he still stated that the pyramids were built by foreigners. The following extract is from Rowlison's Phoenicia, concerning the architecture of Jerusalem. The wall had an original height, this is a quote, the wall had an original height of from 70 to 140 feet. In place, it is built from bottom to top of large squared stones. And you see there, of course, they would have been using... Uh, D different measurements, but you see they are 70 to 140 feet. So the 7 and 14, which is something we see indicative with an Atonist, which is sort of pre-Abrahamism. The Atonist heresy had within their symbolism that same reliance upon 7 and 14. Of course, 7 is, is the number of days within the week. That wasn't always the case, but in the modern world it is. However, it's, it's linked to time. It's a, it's a timely number. It is also a number 
that if one divides into any other number, bar the, the integer multiples of it, they will always produce the Capricar sequence, which is in a, in a decimalized form, of course, which is 1428571. So the two ones obviously act as the confines, right? Um, the, the, the two pillars, uh, Boaz and Yakin, the, the pillars of, of you know, the, the parameters of the box, rather, if you will. The, the spectrum by which existence um, dwells between, like the, the linearity of, of entropy, right? Um, so, of course, 142857 leads pardon me, leaves out 3, 6, and 9. 3, 6, and 9 are the the, the, the circular numbers, right? The numbers that will always uh, circle back to themselves. You can take 3, 6, and 9 times any number by 3, uh, add up the digits, I believe, it will always come to 6, do it with 6, it will always come to, to 3, I believe, and do it with 9, and it will always come back to 9, right? Uh, taking the individual digits of, of the the multiple sums and the sums of its multiplication and you will always get to back to 9, 3 or 6 that they're the only numbers that do that of course as well the circle is 360 degrees take the individual digits of that and you get 9 if you have 360 degrees uh, 180 and add the individual digits, you'll get back to 9. Keep doing that, and you'll always... and add the individual digits, you'll always return back to 9. Again, it's a circular number. It's a number that uh, circles in on itself, and by its existence within this world, does it show that time is circular? Time isn't linear. Time seems to be circular. It is entropy that is linear, right? entropy that is linear and that acts as the sort of rhythm of the circularity of time it's very much like music in that regard um, the sort of circle of fifths um, the, w the way the, the tonalities are structured and also the, the timbre in which one can establish between those tones to thus produce um wildly divergent songs with a rather narrow um, band of of, um, of tones and uh, notes and what have you been, at least in western music continuing on in place it is built from bottom to top of large squared stones beveled at the edges and varying between 3 feet 3 inches and 6 feet in height there you have the 33 and the 6 so, 6 is another number of this world. It's also a number as well associated with time. You have 60 seconds in a minute, uh, 60 minutes in an hour, obviously 24 hours in a day. Um, 24 is, is obviously 6 times 4. So, 4 is, uh, is the box, it's the, the, the... not the box, the square, rather. Um, it is... This is the four elements, obviously the fifth is that which is spirit, it's that which differentiates us from inanimate matter, if you will, um, or inanimate objects. Of course we're shaped like the pentacle, we have five um, appendages our, ourselves, right? Um, the, the higher one, the spirit, is obviously the head, the mind, the brain. Um, however, you're, you're seeing all of this and you're, I'm going to get into it. The sacred geometry that's written into the Great Pyramid actually mirrors this Aleph Tav eclipse. It's very fascinating. So continuing on. The stones are laid without cement. The longest hitherto discovered measures 38 feet 9 inches in length, not less than 100 tons. Many of the other blocks are from half to two-thirds of this height. The massiveness of the work is on par of the Egyptian pyramid kings, and the perfection of the cutting and fitting of the stones is nearly equal. What I suspect, like what we see in Kabbalah, 
with the 231 gates of Kabbalah. And even what we see regarding the Avra Kedavra, or I create um, everything out of nothing, right? I established the four worlds from mere speech, right? From frequency, from nothing. That this priest class, the Abrahamic or Amorite, and all the way back to obviously the, the Asura worshipping cults within the Harappan civilization, they must have discovered an idea. The idea has been at the crux of their power. It has been the anchor point by which they've held on to the capstone of the pyramid, right? That idea is that I believe is the same idea that's put them in the position where technologically they could fit together 100 ton stones without the need for cement or modern equipment, right? modern cranes. Now, barring some sort of, um, you know, ancient technology, uh, physical technology that we are not aware of, the use, like cymatics, the use of sound to alter matter vis-a-vis -vis the, the word, and of course that is merely a, a, a translation of the thought within the prism of the mind, that really does make one ponder. Did they have this, this method of moving stones vis-a-vis -vis sound, like what we see with, for example, the 231 gates of Kabbalah, where the 22 Hebrew letters interconnect, again, 231 times, that adds to six, of course, eh, the individually, and even if you times it, it, it multiplies to six too. That, according to Kabbal eh, Kabbalists, formed through frequency the fabric of the world. Very, very interesting, very fascinating. And of course, 22, 2 plus 2 is 4, 4 plus 6 is 10. And that leads us to the 10 Sephira, right? All the way up to the, the Keter. Omitting, of course, the, the hidden Sephiroth of Da'at. But, yes, it, it's very interesting. I mean, it's, it's just something to note. A bit of trivia. Uh, note, continuing on. Note, Garnier concluded the following. Sufis the first, the builder of the Great Pyramid, and the overthrower of Egyptian idolatry, was none other than the shepherd patriarch Shem. So, we're actually seeing here that the Sufis the first, eh, I believe he also went by yeah Philition, right? Was none o was none other than the shepherd patriarch Shem, right? Where we get the term the Shemitic people, the Shemites from. Um, and then we have a link um, between Shem and uh, mythological gods, i.e. So Shem is essentially Typhon, or Set, the overthrower of Osiris. And the same shepherd king, quote, Set the powerful, quote, who overthrew the same idolatry, and that Philition, the lover of right, the shepherd after whom the pyramid or its builders were called, was the same shepherd patriarch, Shem, the righteous king and founder of Jerusalem. He translated Philition as the lover of right, using the Greek words philo, meaning I love, and ethos, meaning upright, just, or equitable. So literally, the, the lover of the law. Um, in, in, in many, um, many ways. Smith says some strangers from the eastern direction were indeed continually filtering into Lower Egypt through the Isthmus of Suez, the natural channel of immigration in all ages from Asia and the path from which the Egyptians themselves had originally come. The following extract is from Sis. 
Quote, Wilford in his Asiatic Researches, volume 3, page 225, gives an extract from the Hindu records which seems to support certain factors of Manetho's idea that they were of Arabian origin. The extract says that one Tamo Vasta, a child of prayer, uh, I get into it in another book, but essentially they derive from the Transjordanian region, um, or at least that specific group of them did. They were Amorites. O- almost undoubtedly, they were Amorites. They, they're even... The Hexos are even called as much. And of course we have that link with Merneptah within 1200 uh, BC, give or take, where he talks about uh, destroying the Israel, which is obviously uh, Israel, right? So a child of prayer, wise and devout, prayed for certain successes and that God granted his requests and that he came to Egypt with a chosen company entered it, quote, without any declaration of war and began to administer justice among the people to give them a specimen of a good king, unquote. This Tamo Vasta is represented in the account as a good king of the powerful people called the Pali, shepherds, who in ancient times governed the whole country from the, Indu, from the Indus to the mouth of the Ganges, and spread themselves, mainly by colonisation and commerce, very far through Asia, Africa and Europe. They colonised the coasts of the Persian Gulf and the sea coasts of Arabia, Palestine and Africa, and Ir, the long-haired people called the Berbers in North Africa. They are likewise called Palestini, which that name has close affinity with the Philition of Herodotus. These Pali of the Hindu records is plainly identical with some of the Joktanic peoples. The Joktanic peoples are, for example, the, the peoples around, in and around Yemen, right? Uh, sort of Himyar tribes that are there, the, the Bedouins uh, of, of Yemen, sort of South Arabia, uh, where Islam would, would be, um, where Islam sort of cropped up around about there. Extract from Smiths. So I just want want to discuss as well, what you're reading there, that is the the cults and the Harappan civilization that worshipped Pashupati or the lord of all animals, right? And you see that figure crop up everywhere, crop up absolutely everywhere. When they were still making images of Yahweh, he also had horns. Right, you had Hadad and Baal and uh, Amuru. They all had horns. Right, they were all horned gods. And of course, that's continued t- to this day in, in terms of Satan and what have you. Um, the adversarial deity, he has horns as well. Uh, we even see in the Old Testament that uh, I believe if I'm recalling correctly, that Yahweh gave Moses a bull's horns so that he could g- gorge the nations, right? could charge them and gorge them. Um, so you have all of this sort of imagery that's present within the text as well. And that's hearkening back to the Genesis point of this, uh, this plan within a plan this slow struggle towards the Aquarian age, the age of Saturn, where Saturn will return, or time, literally, Kronos, time will return, um, synonymous with Yahweh, by the way, time will return and shall uh, recreate its kingdom upon Earth, where you had the, the golden age, right? this ancient wisdom that has been lost, that they shall succeed this time in, in re- re-erecting the, the Tower of Kronos, the Tower of Saturn, right? Again, that's sort of symbolic for technology and for ensuring the 
pure and unadulterated, um, calculating efficiency um, of the world, right? To re-envision the world, to recreate it into a machine with a machine mind, a machine soul, a machine heart. And for everyone else within that world to be pinned, shackled to the post forever vis-a-vis -a, -vis a digital imprisonment, uh, in Terran vis-a-vis -vis programmatic code, right? Code, of course, is very similar to the Hebraic term Kodesh, which means, uh, you know, um, holy or breath, literally breath, right? The breath of, of God, the breath of uh, divinity uh, into man. So that's how they're recreating on earth the conditions in heaven, or so they believe, right? They believe it'll be a utopia. It'll be far from a utopia. But I'll get into that later on. Extract from Smith's The Great Pyramid. Herodotus elaborates by explaining that Heops, or Cheops, on ascending the throne, plunged into all manner of wickedness. He closed the temples and forbade all Egyptians to offer sacrifice, compelling them instead to labour, one and all, in his service. It's the same idea. This Aquarian archetype. Saturnian archetype, right? Enslavement. Vis-a-vis -vis in building the Great Pyramid, Cheops was succeeded by his brother, uh, Hephren, who imitated the conduct of his predecessor, built a pyramid, but smaller than his brother's, and reigned 56 years. Thus, during 106 years, the temples were shut and never opened. And he says the Egyptians so detest the memory of those kings, Cheops and Kephren, that they do not much like even to mention their names. Hence they, common, pardon me, hence they commonly called the pyramids after Philition, or Philetus, a shepherd who at that time fed his flocks about the place. Piazzi points out that the following two pharaohs, according to Menetho, Mycerinus, and Esekis, also built pyramids but were praised for reopening the temples, so it was not the act of building that made the people hate them, Cheops and Kephren, but more likely the religious aspect of closing the temples. He also suggests that the animosity towards the 15th and 17th dynasty, Hexos, may have been caused by the experience of the 4th dynasty, Hexos. Wow. So there you go, whenever they got into Egypt, they were attempting to impose some form of ancient Abrahamism, you know, monotheism. So it's something that it clearly goes back thousands and thousands of years. It's only been, it seems to be for, have been formalised only within, according to their tradition, the 5th century BC or something. Um, and then onwards it's obviously branched off into its various sects. So without further ado, let us now look at the mathematical properties of the Great Pyramid and the connection of the 6666, or 6 years, 6 months, 6 weeks, and 6 days inherent within this ecliptic cycle between 2017 and 2024. Essentially 7 years, right? There's the 7 again. The Pyramid of Giza is the most precisely oriented structure on Earth at the present time and in the known history of architecture both human and perhaps of non-human intervention. The north face of the Great Pyramid of Giza aligns to true north and is only awry by approximately 3 sixtieths of a degree. The Great Pyramid's height is exactly 146.6 metres and when this is multiplied by 1 billion, then the sum equals the distance between the Earth and the Sun. The Great Pyramid is nearly 6 million tonnes, including the ancient facade and golden capstone that at one time adorned its peak, and if we multiply that by one quintillion, then you will achieve a value that is the exact mass of the Earth, or about six septillion tons. Again, notice all of these sixes. 
if one takes the height of the pyramid, 146.6 metres, and the perimeter of the pyramid, or 920 metres, and one multiplies both, uh, both of these values by 43,200, then the sum then the sum yielded rate, then the sum yielded relates almost exactly with the polar radius of the Earth and the equatorial circumference of the Earth. 43,200 indeed seems like a rather arbitrary figure, but it is not. 43,200 is 72 multiplied by 600. That is the reduction of the far lengthier computation of 6 plus 6 times 6 times 600, right, equals 43,200. 432 also links with 369. Um, if you take 369 and you times them all together, you get 162. Of course, when we understand that the hexagram is constructed by two three six nines, right? And I'll I'll put the graphic up right now for that. Then we we times that one hundred sixty two by two, and we get to three two four, right? So you're seeing another reconfiguration of the four three two there, right? Again, with the six plus six times six times six hundred, that is. The 6666. Six, six. Incidentally, there are 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, and 24 hours in a day, or 6 times 4 hours, 4 being reminiscent of the Cartesian plane, or also known as the mandala, meaning circle, that encompasses the yantra, meaning machine contraption, the square. Quote, despite its cosmic meanings, a yantra is a reality lived because of the relationship that exists in the tantras between the outer world, the macrocosm, and man's inner world, the microcosm. Every symbol in a yantra, or square, is ambivalently resonant in inner-outer synthesis, and is associated with the subtle body and aspects of human consciousness." Unquote. Continuing on, there are 12 months in a year, or 6 times 2 months, and the average month has 30 has 30 days, or 6 times 5 days. A leap year is 6 times 61 days, 366 days. Additionally, six-sided hexagons can be tiles, and if you seek to tile circles, triangles, or rhombi, then the geometric shape that is always formed will be that of a hexagon. So that is the prototypical existential form of life that which is carbon, the charcoal, or the product of the blazing inferno that has since quelled itself into stasis, a temporary stasis at that. Molecules, more often than not, form in hexagonal skeletal structures, given the nature and geometry of carbon, as previously mentioned. In addition, we have six elements of carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulphur, they comprise 98% of all living matter in our known habitable universe. Carbon, the cornerstone of those elements in, the re in regards to the survival of life, is element number 6 and has an atomic weight of 12.01, or almost 6 times 2, with an abbreviated categorization of C, that being the third letter of the alphabet. It goes without saying, but the psychopathic and bureaucratically deranged desire to reduce our carbon. And that is the cryptic and euphemistic admission by the elite that they seek a harvest of humankind, a reduction of it all, and of all life on this planet, in a colossally callous way. If one arranges six-sided atoms into hexagons, then one will be successful in producing graphene, the strongest element known to man, the key to the gateway of nanoparticulated bioimplants, transhumanism, the internet of all things, and self-assembling nanoreceptacles for the colonization of the two-thirds of man, body and mind, which will ensure the inoculation of man against his higher spiritual aspect. The latter part would be the death of God, or the detachment of man from his higher urge to unify and thus dissolve back into figuratively speaking, the essence of God or the pleroma, the fullness of all potentiality. 
If one multiplies any number by six and then sums the resulting di individual digits until one does yield only a solitary integer, then it will produce a sequential pattern of three, six and nine. Cubes have six sides, or one for each of the possible corresponding directions of three-dimensional space. There are six full radians in a circle, and a circle contains 360 degrees, or six times 60 degrees. We may also take 360 degrees and then add the individual digits until we only have one integer, and then half the number, and do the same, halving the number and doing the same infinitely. And we will find that we shall always produce a solitary integer of 9. If one multiplies the Great Pyramid of Giza's measurements by pardon me, 6 plus 6 times 6 times 600, then one will yield the proportions of the planet. 6 plus 6 times 6 equals 72, or the number of years required for the shift of one arc degree of the Earth's axial precession, an astronomical period within the greater precessional cycle of 25,920 years, or 12 ions of 2,160 years. You'll notice by the way all the individual digits of 72 years, 2,160 years, 25,920 years, they all add to numbers which then um, one can add the individual digits of those numbers to always get to a solitary integer of 9. Always goes back to 9. Finally, 72 also relates to the Tetractis of Yahweh, or the projection of the Tetragrammaton, into a Pythagorean Tetractis of 10 sections, corresponding with the Sephira and the numerical outline of the beginning and end, following the exhaustion of all pos possible integers. A mystical cipher that denoted the true name or value of a subject or object, and this yields the value of 72. This then produces the Hebrew name of Yod, Aleph, Vav, or Eav, the Hebraic pronunciation of 72. So what we see there is essentially the, the expansion of the letters. The, the Kabbalists call um, the key to Zerampin which is the little face of God, or the little face of the Lord. I won't get into that, it's uh, fairly convoluted. We don't really have to understand that, to, to understand really what these individuals are getting at. But, as we see written by Moshe Chaim uh, Luzato, relating to the root of, of David, or the root of the duad 2, of the square root of 2 producing 1.414, again, there's the 14 again, right? that we see in Atonism, and of course that can be subdivided down um, into its base of 7, or that which is comprised of 14s, and is thus linked to the temporal and timely 7, as was the case with the customary 14 rays of the Aten within the heretical dogma of Akhenaten. Quote, In the same order in which they appear in the name, in the mystery of 10 and the mystery of 4, in some all that exists is founded on the mystery of this name, and upon the mystery of these letters of which it consists. This means that all the different orders and laws are all drawn after and come under the order of these four letters. This is not one particular pathway, but rather the general path, which includes everything that exists in the Sephirot and all their details in which brings everything under its order. And you can see there, obviously, the great name of God, as they say, um, or the Lord, is 72, right? Adds to 72. Another rabbi on the Tetragrammaton and its links with the ya uh, with Yahweh Seviot, or Sabaoth, the Lord of the Armies. So I'm going to skip this section, because this is going into the discussion on the Aeon of Aquarius, which is important, but I won't discuss it in this uh, in this uh, video because the video would go on for literally hours. All right here we go. So, to provide a brief overview of the three primary eclipses that form the Aleph Tav eclipse event 
of 2017-2024. Prior to a specific breakdown of the important symbolism found within each of these events. So, across the screen right now, you'll see the first figure. This is the Aleph. It's depicting the final Aleph, or beginning, uh, the Great Recess, or rebeginning, formed by the ecliptic events of August 21st, 2017. Um, October 14th, 2023, and April 8th, 2024, so that's the finalising of that Aleph, right, is the, is the 2024 eclipse that goes right across the continental uh, United States. And in the, the right, well, I'll get into it, I'll get into it. The next figure, the Tav, Tav formed by the total solar eclipses of 2017 and 2024. The apex is over the area known as Little Egypt, Illinois. The closest town to that is known as Makanda. The Tav, uh, this is the next figure. The Tav and Ring of Fire Empyrean in the Greek. The intersection of the October 14th, 2023 Ring of Fire and the April 8th, 2024. This crossover of two complete eclipses over the continental United States has not occurred, get a load of this, since 1492, or the year Columbus, dove, literally meaning dove, part of the clique, uh, dove is also a symbol of Yahweh, uh, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, right? In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. All part of the clique, of course. So points to note, Regarding the Little Egypt apex, and this ties back in with what we were discussing regarding the Hexos, on April 8th, 2024, Illinois shall see their second total eclipse in seven years. The area of the apex or intersection point of that eclipse is known as Little Egypt. Accordingly, the cross is very near the township of Macanda, Illinois. Once possessing the town motto or general nickname of the Star of Egypt, that is, of course, Sirius, as mentioned. Interestingly, the exact intersection point appears to be on the east side of Cedar Lake at Salem Road. The Cedar Lake links to the Cedars of Lebanon, or Cedros Lebani, and that is something that links with the Abrahamic eschatology and the wrestling with God that the seed of Jacob incessantly undertakes. The cedar, naturally, is an evergreen or coniferous species of tree, as opposed to the sacred tree of the oak being associated with both Yahweh and all of the other various pantheon leaden demiurges. And this is symbolic of heaven, or the immortal quality that is imbued within the prime principle of consciousness. This will relate to our preceding note on Manhattan and how it connects with the eclipse. The anniversary of the New World Eclipse, another point to note. The New World Eclipse, October 21st, 1492, which occurred exactly nine days. There's the nine again. The number of primary stars within Orion as well, as depicted on the full tarot card. After Columbus landed in the Americas, and of unequalled interest, the April 8th, 2024 eclipse are exactly... 560 eclipse years apart, 194,104 days, 500th anniversary of sighting of Manhattan. April 8th, 2024 is precisely nine days, again another nine, part of the circular numbers, three, six and nine, as we witness from the very ancient traditions of the Vedic philosophy and the concept of the Nevadic Pala or the guardians of the nine directions with, of course, the ninth point uh, at the centre of the eight-rayed star being that of Shiva, or destruction. And that forms a rainbow, or a flash of light. What's called in Hebrew as a uh, bakava, right? Interestingly. Apart from the 500-year anniversary of the first sighting, so April 8th, 2024 is 500 years apart, exactly, from the first sighting of Manhattan Island 
um, by the explorer Varanz Verrazano on April 17th. Oh, pardon me. It is nine days out. Nine days out, sorry. On April 17th, 1524, New York City sees a notable 90% coverage of the 2024 eclipse. Moreover, it is precisely 400 years since the first Dutch colonists arrived in New York, 1624. Wow. Of which it was named New Amsterdam in those days and was but an extension of the Amsterdam central banks and moneyed interests found within that area in Europe. Indeed, this is exactly why we see Wall Street, like the wall that wails, of the ancestral and promised abode, and the financier class of the new Atlantis of the USA centred in Manhattan. The etymology of Manhattan is thus. The name Manhattan originated from the Lenapis language, Munsi, Manhattan, or Manahattan, where Manaha means gather, at means bow, and an is an abstract element used to form verb stems. The Lenape word has been translated as, quote, the place where we get bows, or, quote, place for gathering the wood to make bows, unquote. This is further reinforced vis-a-vis -vis the 19th century mythologist and scholar Albert Sekakaquind Anthony, and remarked that Manhattan was named as such due to the grove of hickory trees that grew there, of which the wood of the hickory is perfect for the production of the typical Native American shortbow. The hickory is a deciduous species of tree, or it is at the mercy of the seasons and dies and rises with the ebb and flow of the cosmic energy. Unlike the cedar of the evergreen, it is not immortal, and it is thus symbolic for the lord of the earth. With a great deal of focus placed on the site of Manhattan during this ecliptic event on, on April 8th, along with its cabalistic and eschatological connotations of the primeval battle, between God and the Lord, the being and the ego, then we can truly see why it is so heavily focused and entwined with this said event. Additionally, a great deal of the promotional art for the upcoming movie and potential social primer, Civil War, releasing on uh, the 12th of April, or three days after the post-ecliptic threshold of April 9th has been passed, includes a suspicious emphasis on New York and its landmarks. Of course as well, April 9th, that's when, so you have April 8th, which is 4-8, right, in terms of the American dating system, yeah, the order of it. So you have 48, which is of course half that, you get 24, 20, 24. 24 is of course six times four, so you have that connection to the 6. But April 9th is 49. Right? 49, 24. So interestingly, as we see, 49, like the Grand Sothic cycle of 49 years, is 7 squared, or 7 times 7. You've got the 7 again there as well. Right? It's almost numerate numerically ritualistic, where they're moving from the 24, 48, 6 times 8, 6 times 4, you know, the, the 6, the world of carbon, that's now being moved away, away from. There's an exodus, if you will, going on from that um, energetically. And we're going to the, to the 7 now, right, so the, the number of the Demiurge, the number of time, the number of Saturn, Kronos, Yahweh, right? Um, you see that within the, the menorahs as well. But interestingly, 4 plus 9 is 13. 13 is obviously the hit, the number of the hidden uh, sign of the zodiac, the central sign of which all other archetypes, fra fractures, fragments of the archetypes emanate out from, like rays, um, of light 
and that is the Ophiakis. But interestingly, the Ophiakis, and I, I think I get into it within the, the age of Aquarius notes, the aeon of Aquarius notes, where the, the Ophiakis is linked, the 13th sign is linked to the Death Tarot card, right? Which is the 13th Tarot card. And of course, 13 uh, is the number, uh, pardon me, is, is the ordinal number and the ordinal location of the letter M. So you have the Masons, for example, but the M itself is the two uh, the two pillars, the two confines of the world of, ex of existence, right? This symbolizes existence. They are joined together, but how are they joined? They're joined in what is known statistically as a bimodal distribution, a bimodal trough, right? What does that mean statistically? Well, essentially, it's, it is the statistical illustration of a harvest or a genetic bottleneck or a death on mass. So bear that in mind. And of course, as well, Saturn is an extremely paranoid uh, fellow, right? The archetype wants to hold on to power. We see that within the story of Kronos and, and Saturn, which was borrowed by the Latins from the Greek uh, Kronos. But he, uh, with his sister wife Rhea, um, birthed his Olympian children and then ate them, right? He buried them in his stomach. He interred them in his stomach in the cave, right? In the cave of darkness. That is emblematic of ignorance. That is what Saturn seeks to do, to have us all in this crass consumer culture, right? This archetype seeks to plunge the world into darkness, into ignorance, to buy your subservience with crass overabundance of utterly worthless goods that are labelled as luxury. That is the Aquarian archetype. Again, we'll get into all of that in the Age of Aquarius notes that uh, supplement this. The Age of Pisces with the ensign of the two fish, or the age that is comprised of two divergent epochs, began in earnest with the dying and rising symbol of Christ, born of a virgin, being hoisted onto the emblematic intersection of the crucifix. That intersection points to Christ and to his burning heart, encompassed by a ring of thorns, or the notion of the baptism by fire that leads past the thorns into the illuminating rose with its delicate and fragile petals. The heart is related to the monad, or the unmanifest source that is all potential or being, and it is that infinitely small point that contains the infinitude of all becoming. It is a sea contained within a bottle, the dark singularity in the centre of the ecliptic corona of light. It is the seedbed of nothing from which sprang everything that is or ever will be. Christ, the key to the door that leads from the Piscean age, he who shall make of the faithful fishers of men within these dark times, was born of the Virgo or Virgin within an immaculate conception, like an inverse of the Gnostic myth of Sophia, sinfully given birth to Yaldabaoth, the dark womb that gave birth to black light, of the weaver of illusion, the spinner of the original lie, directly across from Pisces is Virgo, of which is of no surprise is nothing, is in our patterned world. A similar thing occurred within the Aeon of Ares, of whose archetypal figure was that of Moses, or, a or Akhenaten, and he brought forth the laws, and acted as the messenger of the God of Judgment, and the balancing of the scales. Naturally, directly opposing Ares is that of the sign of Libra, the balancing of the scales in the autumnal equinox, the height of the fall where day makes way for night. Indeed, set Yahweh, his, this deity of judgment and perdition, is associated with darkness and night. Verily, I pay heed to the truth that nothing is by accident within this vivarium of experience. 
In the case of the Aquarius, we see the, the man who tips the sacred grail of libation, Bina and Hokma, and overturns its contents, symbolic of the radical departure from hierarchy and an unravelling of the old structures that will present itself within this age, the dualistic structure of the grail or womb and libation or sperm is poured out onto the earth by man and through this interference pattern shall the great reset be. The cabal who rules the world with an iron fist knows this and are seeking, via their traditional veneration of this demiurge of time and thresholds, to preempt this transition, to thus maintain their stranglehold on power. This is indeed what all of their multifaceted eschatological myths entail, a plan to weather the, gr the next great deluge, unfurled by the Aquarian archetype, the divinely terrestrial figure of man, overturning all things, that man kills man. The true essence of man as an interference pattern upon the linear horizon of time and upon himself, hence the Aquarian sign being that of the watery waveform. Although Aquarius is an air sign, that element which is imperceptible yet is a higher and driving force of change in the current it generates, we see that Aquarius is directly opposite of Leo the lion, and of course the group that is foisting us into this age of Aquarius has as its ancient ensign, that of the lion. Of course, Yaldambeoth has the body of a snake and the head of a lion. And you have the Leontiades, the lion-faced god, right? The, the god of time within Persia, known as Zervan. Of course, to the Romans, he was Mithras. Right? He was also known as the Leontocephaline within the mystery religions throughout uh, the Western, Eastern, uh, Mediterranean, and, uh, of course, the Near East region too. The Leontocephaline is the lion-faced Hierophant. The Hierophant is the revealer of secrets, the revealer of the sacred, the revealer of the mystery. This is going into the Aeon of Aquarius notes, so I'm going to skip this again. Right, the last time the Tav eclipse occurred, or the crossing of eclipses within 10 years of each other, was in 1492, when Columbus sailed the ocean blue. What are the chances? The Radonite Templar Columbus, not his real name, discovered the Americas on the same year of this auspicious and seldom seen astronomical event, and now approximately 250 years after the founding of the USA, nearing its embittered end. Of course, 250 years is the rough lifespan of empires. We, we now find this same astronomical event occurring once again. The Great American Eclipse of 2017 began in Salem, Oregon. Salem, or Shalem, is the ancient name for Jerusalem and means peace or perfect completeness in a more literal manner. Ben Salem, or New Jerusalem, or, or the New Atlantis, as we see from Francis Bacon's, likewise titled, Posthumous Memoirs, on the true meaning behind the founding of America, a base for the conspiracy to thus utilise to corral the world into a vast and endless global utopic state, again the, the Saturni Regna, the Kingdom of Saturn, under the spirit of the Lord of the Earth, again Saturn, Kronos, Time, Yahweh, and Manly P. Hall's Secret Destiny of America. It also will pass through Makanda, the eclipse, of which in the early 20th century it used the slogan Star of Egypt. That is Sobdet, or Sothis, Sirius to us, or the Dog Star. That which accompanies the Fool, or Orion, is Kessel, or Fool, uh, in Hebrew is the name for Orion within that culture and language. And that is depicted within the alignment of the Great Pyramids of Giza, corresponding with Orion's belt. Makanda in Sanskrit corresponds to the mango tree, and that is a symbol most closely associated with Prajapati, or the Lord of all creation. Prajapati is a compound of Praja, creation, procreative powers, and Pati, Lord, Master. 
The term means Lord of creatures or Lord of all born beings. Hence, it is the Brahmic variant of the ancient Shaivite Pashupati or the Lord of all animals. Francis Nash was a revolutionary general and a mason. Oh, by the way, the animals, the beasts. Those were seen within the Gnostic tradition and most traditions um, as being symbolic of the angels or the, the lower servants or messengers of the gods. Of course, the Gnostics would know them as the archons, the world builders, those who, the, the powers, the elements that rule this world and of course are found within the uh, microcosmically, internally, within our own archetypal a fractured psyche, right? Compartmentalized psyche. Continuing along the pathway of the eclipse to its exit at Charleston on the eastern seaboard, we see a monument to Francis Nash. Of Francis Nash, he was a revolutionary general and a mason, if I recall correctly, who was mortally wounded at a battle in Germantown, Maryland, 1777. Notice the sevens, that shall be important. Charleston was named after Charles II, of which we have a Charles in place right now, and Charles II's father, Charles I, was he who was ousted by the rabbinate of Mulheim via their agent Cromwell during the English Civil War. Timer Kronos, that is the deposed archetypal Basileus, that seeks to make of man a walking monument to ignorance, and within this perpetual darkness can this force that Abrahamism reveres more easily control a dependent and utterly subservient man. Again, I think that's getting into the Aeon of Aquarius notes. So, continuing along, of course, Charles in the Proto-Germanic eh, derives from a root, Carles, which means free man. Notice the hand signs of Charles II, something we do not see with his father, Charles I, and thus Charles II must have got the message, so to say, after obviously Charles I lost his head following the rabbinates of Mulheim eh, and their agent Cromwell eh, plotting his downfall and putting it into, of course, practice. The Shin holding the orb of power, the Shin being the name of the Lord or showing who secretly controls the world and the power of the state. And the left hand of Charles II points to the ground. The shin's a letter in the Hebrew alphabet. The, sh um, the left hand of Charles II points to the ground or the Malkuth, right? The, the kingdom, the, 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 the world, if you will. The physical kingdom and the chthonic power from which the royal and priestly lines derive their power from, Saturn. Charles II was also the one to fully implement the Bank of England, something the rabbinate of Mulheim desperately desired, naturally, along with the death of Charles I. As we see James II and VII, the Scots variant of Yaakov, the penultimate monarch of the line prior to the of Orange dynasty assuming control. Notice again the Shin hand sign uh, on the to the left on his right hand, but this time it is far more prominent. And again, he's pointing down to the floor, showing just where uh, the, the power derives from, right? The Chthonic deities. On the Seven Code and other symbolic anomalies of the Great American Eclipse of 2017, there's seven cities named Salem. Salem, Oregon, the capital of Oregon, was the first major city in the US to see totality, eh, or that which will see totality, to come. Salem is shorthand for Jerusalem and means peace in Arabic, and is related to the Hebrew Shalom. Of course, it may link to Shalim as well, which is the evening star, but we won't get into that etymology. The eclipse path passed over seven towns named Salem in the US, they were nearly evenly spaced along the line in Oregon, Wyoming, Idaho, Nebraska, Missouri, Kentucky, and South Carolina. Nashville. The first total eclipse over the area of Nashville 
Tennessee since 1478. Country music fact. The number one country song at the time of the eclipse was, quote, Body like a back road, I know every curve like the back of my hand. That is the, the main hook or chorus of it. So, that idea of, I know every curve like the back of my hand, obviously the curve links to the, the pathway of the eclipse, and furthermore the back of the hand um, links to the philosopher's hand, or the hand of Sibeoth, which is uh, an earlier uh, rendition of it, and of course in between that you had the Benedictio Latina. However, with the, the, ha the philosopher's hand, uh, um, what we see is that on the palm of the hand, it has seven signs, right? On the palm of the hand, the sixth and seventh sign is the fish and mercury, right? Um, and also then the seventh is fire. So what you're seeing regarding that is the back of the hand is this doing away, is this burning of the Piscean Age, which is what we see with the philosopher's hand. I'll try and I'll, I'll put up an image uh, here of that. Interesting historical yearly anniversaries of 2017. The 500th anniversary of Protestant Reformation. The 500th anniversary of the first defeat of the Spanish conquistadors in the Americas at the Battle of Shampton in what is now Mexico. The 500th anniversary of the first official European delegation to China. The 100th anniversary of the Balfour Declaration. The 100th anniversary of the US entrance into World War I. The 100th anniversary of Russian Bolshevik Revolution. The 100th anniversary of the birth of John F. Kennedy. The 50th anniversary of the Abrahamic control of Jerusalem. The 50th anniversary of the American Summer of Love. Sevens and seventies. Seven months exactly after Donald Trump's first full day in office. January 21st, 2017. That is this... Uh, uh, 2017, uh, 21st of August eclipse, who won the presidency by 77 electoral votes and assumed it, and assumed his first full day when he was 70 years, 7 months and 7 days old. Trump was born the day of a lunar eclipse, June 14th, 1946. Again, the moon links with Saturn as well. We're going to see that on a, uh, a sort of hidden... A US debt a image. 70th anniversary of beginning of the Israeli war for nationhood in mandatory Palestine. The 70th anniversary of the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. The 70th anniversary of the founding of the CIA. 70th anniversary of Roswell flying saucer incident. The eclipse path was 70 miles wide. Saros 145. The character Eclipse is composed of 77 events. The Eclipse of August 21st, 2017 is its 22nd. The number of Hebrew letters within the Hebrew alphabet. 2017 was Hebrew year 5777. Historical calendar peculiarities. Calendar date August 21st, date of the Eclipse. Two other great eclipses occurred on the date of August 21st in the 20th century. August 21st, 1914, World War I, Saros 124. One of the most clearly ominous eclipses in modern history, fighting begins in the worst slaughter in human history, to that point just as the total solar eclipse divides Europe, divides Europe, Ottoman Empire and Russia. August 21st, 1933, the Jerusalem Ring of Fire, as uh, the German regime seizes control in Germany. The ring, a ring of fire eclipse in Jerusalem and Baghdad is seen. So I won't get into Saros 145, but essentially a Saros is a measurement. It's a period of about 18 years, or specifically 18 years, 11 months and 8 days between, repeti between repetitions pardon, of solar and lunar eclipses. In Ezekiel's vision, the Lord has his angels separate the demographic wheat from the chaff by going through Jerusalem, the capital city of ancient Israel, and inscribing a mark, a tav, upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry 
for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. So you've got to be marked by the Tav to survive. And moreover as well, we see the same thing with the Passover. Right, it is the Tav that's painted on the top of the uh, on the top of the doors. So essentially, April 9th, I believe, is the onset of this Aquarian age. Now, it is to begin within 2050 AD, but I think the spirit they're, they're attempting to bring into the world, beginning on April 9th, that Kronos, that father of time spirit, that Yawishan spirit, right? So the ritualism of the end that beckons the re-beginning, right? So that is what this Alep Tav is about. Atis Oyas, Oyas Atis, as they scream, while swinging the serpent above their head in a Bacchic frenzy, they praise Jupiter Sebeoth, a cryptic transliteration of Yahweh Seviot, Yahweh Lord of the Hosts, and from this do they seek to draw from the festering wound of the West a new kingdom, a Saturnia Regna reborn, a kingdom of Saturn reborn. So see the US date clock at the top right is a hidden hyperlink at figure above, um, or the, the images above, as you can see. If clicked on, what will then appear? A map of the US overlaid with the Aleph Tav Eclipse and the ominous caption, New Kingdom. This is the New Atlantis or Ben Salem that Francis Bacon's posthumously published New Atlantis, 1627, spoke of. The secret destiny of America, where the melting pot of the world was to be alchemically putrefied by the fire of chaos. Again, what do you do in a melting pot? You have a fire underneath it, once you have all the available ingredients put inside this, uh, the confines within the, the, the belly of Kronos, right? They're all put there, left there in darkness, ignorance. Um, and then you set a, a light, the cauldron, right, until they are reduced fully to their base essence, which is carbon, pure jet blackness, and uh, the, the colour of the void, right? And from the pregnant ashes would be birthed an unending world dominion that they have sought since time immemorial. So as we see, just a brief breakdown of this, this hidden uh, image on the US debt clock, and, and they've changed this image by the way, it's now changed, this was only, this only appeared for, um, I believe, a week or so because people have been sending me a different image in their state, and no, it didn't say New Kingdom, but it, it did when I, I looked at it, um, and I was sent this, and, and thank you to uh, Michael Winters for sending me uh, this screen grab. Notice the Piscean fish symbol, of which the Piscean age is divided into two distinct ages of 1080 years or 1080 years approximately each. We have the seven traditional planets, with the moon and Saturn at, their, at either extent, and the constellations of Leo and Virgo. Leo and Virgo stretch between July 23rd and September 22nd or the autumnal equinox. This encompasses the first great American eclipse of 2017. The direct mirror of these zodiacal constellations are Pisces and Aquarius, the ionic transitionary zodiacal signs, and they stretch between the dates of January 20th to March 20th. In the sequential zodiacal path, Pisces and Aquarius are the 12th and 11th signs. 11 plus 12 equals 23. 23, if you add the individual digits, comes to 5. That's the pentacle. It's, it's man. Uh, funnily enough as well, a very abbreviated term for the Lord, or just in general God, within Abrahamism, is uh, the he letter. Right, it's, um, it's uh, H E I. That is how it would be spelt in its anglicised form. And that stands in for the number five. So obviously five is the pentacle, right? You, This goes all the way back to ancient Egypt and the Halul. 
the Hillul sign, the, the sign of jubilation, where one would raise their hands up, right? So obviously the, the head with plus the two hands forms the sort of shin shape, and um, the two legs uh, plus the head forms that sort of Y shape, right? Um, the Pythagorean Y principle, the Lichtenberg pattern, the growth um, the pathway of growth within the cosmos, right? That type of idea. So it's the intersection of the two um, through the shin, through destruction, which is what the shin pictographically means. The, the singular unitary essence is then bifurcated, right? Into the Piscean legs, if you were to think of it within the subtle body conception. However, uh, the Halul would later develop from ancient Egypt to the Hallelujah, which you see at the Battle of Rephidim, uh, where Moses is to raise his hands up and to cast the sign of the Shin, which, according to Second Kings 21.7, is the name of the Lord etched into Jerusalem. He is to cast that sign of destruction upon, um, I believe, the Amalekites below Every time he lowers his hands, uh, the Amalekites gain victory, um, or are close to gaining victory, and every time he has his hands up in the sign of the Shin, uh, that casts a shadow into the battlefield, the, the Israelites gain victory. Continuing on, and uh, Pisces and Aquarius share a close proximity to the new dawn of Aries, or the beginning of the true new year. Leo, or the Lion, that which faces Aquarius, or the coming Aeon, is emblematic of the religious symbols of the clique orchestrating all of this. In the demiurgic spirit they revere and embody, Aquarius was typically written in medieval alchemical and astrological tomes as simply Kur, or Kappa and Rho, and this may be approximately pronounced as Kur. Uh, Kur or Kur is the name of the chasm that sits below the earth within Sumerian mythology. And we would know this as the underworld, the place where the souls of the dead are conducted to, naturally with Saturn being a chthonic archetype and deity, then such a connection is only fitting. Of note too within Greek isophysy, Kur has the value of 120 or barring the zero a value that is reminiscent of the twelve signs of the zodiacal wheel. Notice too, the Shiva-related rainbow in the centre of the Nevadic Pala, or the eight red star that symbolically relays the eight elements that lead to the Shaivite Prima of the creative destruction, the flash of colours, the Bakava in Hebrew, like the tail feathers of the peacock or the blazing image of the phoenix, and this is emblematic of the point of transcendence or transmigration of one state into another. And of course, it being um, in the backdrop of the, the, the of Pisces, naturally, and with Pisces, of course, having the X, the Tav there anyway, which of course, within yeah, the philosopher's hand, in the middle of Pisces is Mercury, right? Mercury is that metal which transcends both liquid and solid, heaven, heaven and earth, life and death, and, and so on and so forth, right? The, the promises, the Faustian promises of the Aquarian Age, right? Of course, they're all lies. The Tower of Kronos, uh, the Tower of Time, um, the Tower of the Twin, it is all a lie. It's a pure lie. It's built on technology but it's also built on the back of slavery. And what it promises those who are the harbingers, who uh, are the agents who put this into place, who does the will of Saturn on Earth, all they will find at the end of this road of conspiracy is total perdition the perdition of their soul, the perdition of their spirit, the perdition of their body, a totalizing and complete destruction. Continuing on, 
we may also make note of the fact that there are seven planets, flanked by the Moon with Jupiter in the constellation of Virgo on the left and Saturn with Mars in the constellation of Leo on the right. The feminine axis of the left is that of severity or limitation, and given that Virgo faces Pisces, then this symbolises that the Piscean Age is coming to an end, and is that which is to undergo limitation or death. The male axis of the right is that of establishing or generation, and thus due to Leo facing Aquarius, then this symbolises the establishment of the coming age of Aquarius, the end of one age, the beginning of the other, if you will. The age of Aquarius will either be defined by the emancipation of humankind from its chains of ignorance, the understanding of them, the maturity, spiritually, of them, eh, of who they are, where they are, what this is, or by the eternal subjugation of humanity, who will be insectified um, under the yoke of the one-eyed Hierophant, the Demiurgos. This conclusion is additionally reinforced via the Moon and Jupiter being associated with the constellation of Pisces, and alchemically being associated with the feminine axis of severity or limitation. Moreover, Saturn of the Black Sun and Leo of the Sun are always alchemically associated with the male axis of mercy or generation. So just to finish this off, quote, and here fantastic fishes duskily float, using the cam for waters, while their fires throw about quick rhythms along the shallow air. Elizabeth Barrett Browning, A Drama of Exile.